join together with people all over the world. And we can do it in here without fear. Nobody is going to come in and tell us we can't do this. And we are obeying the word of the Lord and we are worshipping him in spirit and truth. So let's pray as we start our service. Father God, I thank you for this time together. For Thank you for your commandment to keep one day holy. Lord, thank you that we can come together and we can join together, we can have fellowship together, we can encourage each other, we can speak together, we can comfort each other, and we can teach each other. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here with us because you've promised you will be here. Lord, as we worship you, as we listen to your word, I pray that you would move us, that you would speak to us individually and as a church, Lord, and that you would enjoy our worship. Amen. Let's stand if you're able and sing together. Over all the earth, you reign on high.
this morning. The oceans are rising, Lord. Let them know your, your power to hold them above those waters. Amen. Now, um, Ed, I'm looking at you, I believe you have something you want to say. Thank you. Claire has no idea what I'm going to say, which is a <laughs> idea. Um, I'm not sure if Jeff Goodway's here, so if you are Jeff, um, he's not. I apologise to Jeff, because really it's his like bag, not mine. But um, Jeff and I had a conversation in the week about the food bank, uh, it's something I feel very passionately about, and um, the... What would be really amazing is if we could share the joy of Easter with some of those families who probably won't be able to enjoy an Easter egg this year. And I'm sure many of us will go out and buy an Easter egg. I will certainly have, well, you know my passion for food. Um, so what I'm, I'd love to do is to just maybe get some Easter eggs to put in the, in the food bank box and take them down. I know normally we would ask for... Jeff would ask for sort of important products like, you know, sanitary products like pasta so that people can feed their families, which is really important. But sometimes it's really good just to share something different, something nice, something you don't normally enjoy. And I just think it would be really great if we as a church could share some of the joy of Easter with those families who are probably having, well, who are having a really difficult time of it. So if you're able to, and I appreciate not everyone able to, next week, if you could just bring an Easter egg down to, yeah, I mean, Yorkies are great, just to say. Um, but genuinely, it doesn't have to be the most expensive in the shop, because there will be kids and adults who would be seeing the adverts on TV, maybe even wondering what Easter is all about, um, and thinking, oh, I wish I could just have... And wouldn't it be great if we could just help them with that? Just a few families, we could make a difference. So, if you're able to, I appreciate. I have asked no one's permission to say this this morning. Say, I really, if you can, just next time you're at the shop, spend a couple of quid if you're able to, and bring it down next week, and we can share a bit of that joy of Jesus at Easter with families who maybe are having a really, who are having a really tough time of it. Thank you, Claire. Thanks, thanks, Ed. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read stories in the Bible, they're all great, but they lack detail. And I, um, you know, you have a a whole story, and they get put into children's storybooks, but they're only like a few sentences long, and I just always wonder what's what's happening behind the scenes on this. So I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to put... I'm going to put some bits in. Now, I am not adding anything to the Bible because it is quite clear that that's very, very wrong. Not going to add anything to the Bible because, you know, I am just human. I know it comes as a bit of a surprise to some people, but I am just human. But I want to tell you a story. We're going to hear a bit from Galatians about spreading the word, spoiler alert, Lex, uh, in a moment. But... This story takes place, and I'm going to set it in context. So, Jesus has died. He's risen again. I think we all knew that. I'm not spoiling any endings to stories. Jesus has risen again. He's appeared to the disciples, and he said to the disciples, right, you need to wait here until I tell you what to do. Now, the disciples have spent the last three years wandering the country about, uh, behind Jesus, being busy. There's lots of stories about them being so tired because they've done so much. And now, I suspect, there's a whole load of men, because it was just men, sitting around going... <sighs> <sighs> they didn't even have cards or Playstations or anything like that, or televised football. And one of them says, well, some of us were were fishermen before. Why don't we go out fishing? Should we go out and we can catch some fish? Something to do before Jesus comes back, because he didn't actually give a time scale, did he? It would have been nice if he'd said, can you wait till next Thursday, and then then you'll know what to do. Or even if he'd said, six months' time, then we'll tell you what to do. We could have done something, but we're just waiting. So they decided to go fishing. Now, in the Bible, this is where the details come, because obviously quite a lot of the disciples were fishermen. Some of them were not fishermen. (laughs) I'm going to guess that Matthew, the tax collector, was going, oh, fishing, that sounds like 
such a lovely idea. It's, I mean, it's quite a small, rickety boat, isn't it? Are we, are we all going on this boat? We are. We're all going on the boat. That's absolutely fine. If I sit in the middle, will that be okay with my eyes closed? Will that be fine with everybody? So they all got on this boat. And they sailed this boat out. And they put their nets out. And they left their nets. Now, they knew, because they were fishermen, that generally this was where the fish were going to be. I mean, I'm going to guess that in the three years that they'd been being disciples, it hadn't, the fishing hadn't changed that much in the Sea of Galilee, that suddenly there were absolutely no fish. But they put their nets out and they caught absolutely nothing. Again, I can imagine Ma- Ma- Matthew, the tax collector, going, oh, so um, this fishing... Um, does this normally happen? Uh, and and, and, and um, Peter and, um, and Andrew going, oh, no, 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 this is usually a really good place to fish, I promise you. Oh, OK, we normally have to wait all night for the fish. No, 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 it normally is. Now, at that point, a man appears on the shore. Now, he's obviously, they're obviously not far enough away from the shore that they can't see him. And... Slightly bizarrely, and I feel the Bible skips over this a little too much. They said it was Jesus, but they didn't recognise him. Now, they've spent three years with this man, three years sleeping next to him, listening to him, looking at him. How are they going? Oh, I wonder who this very strange man is that we've never ever met before. And this man appears, but for whatever reason, the Bible skips over that. And if they say, oh, look, there's a man on the shore. And the man on the shore, it's Jesus, he says, why don't you throw your nets over the other side of the boat if you've not caught any fish? Now, I've watched fish. I've been to the London Aquarium. (laughs) They do not stay on one side of anything. They spread out. If there's no fish on this side of the boat, there is unlikely to be fish on this side of the boat. Now, at this point, again, the disciples are like, strange man has asked us to throw our nets over the other side of the boat. Hmm, that's what we do. We just listen to strangers here. Do not listen to strangers. We listen to strangers. Again, the Bible doesn't say why they went, yes, let's, maybe Matthew was going, well, obviously you're not very good at this, perhaps that's a good idea. Anyway, what they did is they threw their nets over the other side of the boat and within minutes, for some reason, the fish had decided that left side of the boat sea, uh, um, Lake of Gal- Sea of Galilee, was much better than right side of the boat of Sea of Galilee, and their nets were absolutely full. So full, in fact, that it took quite a while to get back to the shore. Now, at this point, I'm thinking maybe, maybe they all should have gone to Specsavers, because they get closer to the edge, and then suddenly, John goes, oh, look, it's Jesus! Oh, yeah, it's Jesus! At which point, Peter, now this I do not understand, I will give you, he picks up his coat, puts his coat on, and jumps into the water. And you're like, I just suspect the rest of them, A, rolled their eyes, what's he doing? Because, of course, he's the one who got out and walked on the water to Jesus. They're all going, he's just showing off now, isn't he? He's trying to do that walking on the water again. He's just going to get wet. Why does he put his coat on? He's just going to sink if he puts his coat on. Anyway, they end up back at the shore with Jesus. And Jesus cooks them fish. They all sit together and we, they have a lovely time. And it's the t- point at which uh, Jesus forgives Peter for, for disowning him when Jesus was dying. Now, I sometimes God asks us to do things that seem very, very strange. God sometimes asks us to do things that we think, well, that's a little bit stupid and wrong. 
How could that possibly going to work? I suspect most of the disciples were thinking, well, put the net over the, the other side of the... Really? The other side? Yeah, whatever. That's not going to work. But sometimes Jesus does ask us to do things that are strange. Jesus asks, God asks us to do things that might seem really stupid and unnecessary. But God has an ultimate plan, and actually he knows considerably more than you do. Now, I know that there, there used to be a song that said, Jesus, um, I will make you fishers of men. Now, my mum, for a long time, thought that that was, I will make you vicious old men. Now, <laughs> she did think that that was slightly against the rest of the teachings of the Bible. <laughs> However, mm, sometime, no, not really. I will make you fishers of men, but it might mean that you have to do something strange or you have to do something that you think is really stupid and unnecessary. But God has a plan for us and he knows, sadly, more than we do. Let's, before the children, as the children go out, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you do ask us to do things that are strange and unnecessary but Lord as we do them you hold us in in your hands and you support us and you hold us up Lord Lord you want us to be fishers of men but sometimes it's in ways that we could not even have dreamt of Lord I pray you would make people here brave you would give them wisdom and bravery to be to do your will this week Lord Amen. Let's have anybody who, anybody who fancies going out can go. No. If you are a child or a young person, you can leave. If you're not a child or a young person, you have to stay. Sorry. <laughs> or you're a leader. You can
Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the ocean, mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. Fail, fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now, this was written thousands of years ago, but yet we still find ourselves in this world in a very similar situation. Nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall. But we need to, when we pray, remember those words the Lord of Almighty is with us and the God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray now for um, areas around the world where there is uh, war. Um, and I'm going to leave some space for you to pray um, on, uh, within your heart for places that are particularly on your mind um, this morning. So Father God, we thank you that you are our fortress and that you are there and you are the author of creation and the Lord of every man. Lord, your heart must break when you see the way that people are treating each other in our world. Lord, you must, your heart must break when you see the war and the bloodshed that is going on, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will be there. Your hand and your Holy Spirit will be there, Lord. I pray for those who are... Um, who are bringing aid into those situations, Lord. I pray that you would be there for their, their safety. Lord, I pray for those who are um, trying to broker peace. Lord, I pray that you would give them wisdom and that you would be with the leaders of countries that are at war, Lord. That you would be in all of those meetings, that you would be invited in and that you would be part of it, Lord. Father, we feel powerless because we can't do anything sitting here in Teddington, in England, in relative safety. But Lord, we can stand in the gap, Lord. We can pray and we can ask you to act. Lord, as we pray in silence now, Lord, I pray you would hear the prayers and the cries that go out from the hearts here and you would act on them. Let's pray for situations which are on your heart. And Father God, thank you that we know the ending of the story. We know that ultimately you will be victorious, Lord. And we pray that that victory will come soon, Lord. That, that peace would, would prevail, not just a cessation of violence, but a true peace where people are able to live together, Lord. I don't know how that happens. I don't have those plans, but Lord, you do. And we pray these, this in your name. Amen. Let's sit and sing. Just before um, Andrew comes, we hear from the Bible when Andrew comes to speak to us. Let's sing um, When the Music Fades. Thank you. 
God, as we listen to your word and listen to Andrew, please speak to us as it is all about you. Amen. Amen. Our reading that Andrew's going to speak to us from is uh, Galatians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 1. <clears throat> so Galatians chapter 2. Then... After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. He did not give in to them. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were, were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognised that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. As um, Andrew comes and speaks to us now, let me pray for him. Father God, thank you that you have been speaking this week to Andrew, Lord. I pray that your words would come to us through him um, and you would lead him by your Holy Spirit to speak into our hearts. Amen. Right, I've been told to speak up so that the... Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. And my name is Andrew Smith. It's a very unusual name, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. My, 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 I've got a brother called Malcolm John Smith. He never told anybody his name was John Smith. He was very upset about that. So. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to be with you. And uh, I do trust that the, the Lord will really speak to us as we look at this passage of Scripture. It's an incredible passage of Scripture. Something that uh, we need to be thinking about very, very carefully. And uh, so I do trust that it's a blessing to you. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for this word. I thank you that you have produced for us an extraordinary Bible of God's word. Help us to understand it fully. Help us to understand it so that we're a blessing to others and a blessing to you. Help us, Lord. We need your help. We need your hope. We need your compassion. We need your hand of blessing. We need your encouragement. We need all kinds of things, Lord, because we're weak and feeble, yet you can make us strong in the Lord, and we're so grateful for that. So help us, Lord, as we look at this word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I was told to speak on three marks of the Christian church. And so I will sort of, I'm not going to make it three points only, but you'll see them there anyway, and as we're going along. And uh, I'm sure it will be interesting. But in, in the first chapter of this, this letter to the Galatians, the, the, apostle, the apostle said that he's writing to them to correct some errors that have been introduced to their church. And so I just want to read a couple of verses from the, the, the first chapter, because that's where he talks about it. He said, I'm astonished that you so, are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul continued by giving them a, a little background, and he came... Uh, came to be preaching the gospel to, uh, on how he came to be preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Why was he preaching the gospel to the Gentiles? All the others were reaching out to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. And initially he had persecuted the church. That's the incredible thing about Paul, isn't it? He, 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 he wanted to get rid of the church. He had persecuted the church. 
But he tried to destroy it completely. But then God revealed himself to Paul. It was an incredible revelation to Paul. And Paul was so moved by that revelation, he decided he wasn't going to persecute the church any longer. He was going to help the church. In fact, he wasn't just going to preach to Jews, but he was going to preach to Gentiles. And that was a big thing. And uh, so God went on to show Paul that the gospel of Jesus was was for Jews, Gentiles, and that he was to take the gospel to the Gentiles specifically. He said in verse chapter 1, verse 22 and 24, he says, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report that the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And, well, it was an incredible story. You can imagine that they were very grateful that this powerful man wasn't going to persecute them any longer. He was helping them. And Paul goes on to tell the Galatians how after 14 years preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, he went up to Jerusalem to share with the Jewish Christian church how the the Gentiles were responding positively to the gospel of Jesus. And it says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, at the beginning of our reading, it says, Then after 14 years... I went up again to Jerusalem, and this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also, and I went in response to Revelation, and, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running, or had not been running my race in vain. I wonder how many people a bit like that today, not just with their Christian experience. Then you sometimes look at what you're doing and think, what am I doing this for? Am I doing it all? Is there any purpose of what I'm doing? Have you ever felt like that? You don't? Yeah. All very positive? That's good. Uh, sometimes it's easy to feel like, what on earth am I doing? But, and then the Lord will reveal to you why he wants you to do this, that and the other. And, and Paul then goes on to share the fact that Titus who was Greek and therefore a Gentile, was not compelled by the Jewish Christians to be circumcised first so that he could be accepted by Jewish believers as as a real child of God. And uh, he explains how this uh, became an issue in verse 4 and 5. He says, This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus to make us slaves. We did not give it in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Now, I've got two points here, two of the main points that we were talking about. The first one is that Paul made it very clear that those who put their faith in Jesus for salvation are not under law but are under grace. That was particularly so that the Jews would understand you didn't have to become a Jew first and then you could become a Christian. We're not under law, we're under grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? I don't want to be under law. I don't want to have to do things so that I'm saved. But I want God to work through me by his Holy Spirit and do things because I am saved. Because I belong to him. Because I'm his child. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Paul says, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. That added nothing to my message. And the second main point was the gospel is for all people everywhere. Everywhere. And God gave the Apostle Paul the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Just look what he says about the Jewish leaders in verse 7 and 8. He says, They recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. So they were reaching out to different people and it made a big difference to him. So Paul was pleased by the acceptance that he had received from the Jewish Christian leaders. And he's telling the Gentiles this because he wants them to realise that they too must watch out that they don't fall and slip into this false doctrine that people had come into their church to try and persuade them to, to, to make the Gentiles Jews before they became Christians by circumcision and all that kind of thing. So Paul was pleased by the acceptance that he received from the Jewish Christian leaders. In verse 9 it says, James, Cephas and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me the Barnab- and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. 
they agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They just added one requirement and that was this. They said all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do all along. So they said, it doesn't matter what background the people are that you're going to, but just don't forget the poor. The poor are very important. And I guess for many years, down through history, that's been the same. People have tried to help the poor, haven't they? The poor are needy. We want to help them. Because they're crying out for help, aren't they? And so he said, don't forget, when you're sharing the gospel, don't forget the poor. That's very important. And, and uh, Paul realized that the gospel was for all people, Jew, Gentile, rich and poor. But how do we relate to, the, to this passage, uh, or how do we relate this passage to the church? How do we pass this on to the church? How do, we, how do we relate to other denominations? Have you thought about that? When I was growing up in, in Africa as a missionary kid, um, we were convinced the Baptists were the only ones who were right. That was a very long time ago. You know, everybody else was wrong. But, but now, since that time, so many things have happened. And uh, uh, the, the Anglican Church, and to a great extent, has gone through all kinds of, 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 of evangelical change. And there's some wonderful churches in, in that denomination. And, and there are wonderful churches in other denominations. And we know that denomination makes no difference. What makes a difference is, are we born again? Do I belong to Jesus? I don't mind what church you belong to. I want to know whether you belong to Jesus. Do you belong to Jesus? Yes. You do? Yes. Oh, I'm glad I'm here then. Yes. <laughs> I do, I do. You're I belong good. to Jesus. Praise God, praise God. And, but it's not only how, how do we relate to other denominations, but how do we relate to other races? How do we relate to the rich and to the poor? How do we relate to all people that happen to be different to us? How do we relate to them? After all, the, the, the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. His whole purpose was salvation. The church some years back went through the whole time where they were saying, you know, God has chosen special people long before and all this kind of thing. And I thought to myself, how can that be? He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to his whole purpose is saving the world, the whole world. He loves the world so much. Do you understand that? Very, very important. Very, very powerful. What Paul says in verse 6 is fundamental to our faith in Jesus. God does not show favoritism. Let me illustrate... Um, I moved across here from Africa in, 19, uh, in 20, 22, wasn't it, I think? 20, 2001 or 2002, something like that, I can't remember, something like that. But uh, at my first church that I took over was the King's Cross Baptist Church. And uh, the Lord led us there, I haven't got time to tell you all about it, but it was quite extraordinary and uh, how the Lord led us to the King's Cross Baptist Church. The building probably could hold about 200 people, big old Victorian building, but there was about 30 to 40 people there in attendance and uh, with a few kids and so on and, as well. There were, there were quite a lot of nationalities because it was a very multiracial area and, and I think we had about seven or eight nationalities. But outside in the street there were multitudes of people. I would look, put my head out and say, Lord, how do I reach out to all those people? Look at Every day I look out the window and, and there's multitudes of people walking past. Remember one day I had to take my... Uh, one of my daughters down to the hospital about 3 o'clock in the morning for some reason. I can't remember what it was, but I remember going down towards Houston Station at 3 o'clock in the morning, and the roads were... F plenty of people walking down. It could, it could have been 2 o'clock in the afternoon in most cities. Incredible city. You know, there's 194 nationalities in London. 194. There's only 198 nationalities in the world. That's true. There's many more languages, 380 or something, but lots of languages, but there's only 90, 198. So somebody once said, don't tell the four nations that are not here. They'll be here by next week if you tell them. <laughs> but 194, it's now the most multicultural city on earth. It used to be New York, it no longer is. There's more races and groups of people in London than there, than there is in any other city on earth. You think, what an opportunity. I know we've got to sing 
send out missionaries to Africa and all that kind of stuff, and India or wherever it might be, we're sending out missionaries. But the fact is, we've got a mission field. We have a mission field, an extraordinary mission field. Just about every tribe and nation is here, in the city. It's incredible. Obviously, we spent a long time seeking to know how we're going to reach out to these people. And I don't want to go into it today, it's too long, but God gave us a real plan. And I was there for about 12 and a half years, and to the height of the ministry, just towards the end of our time there, I remember thinking, I'd like to count how many nationalities we've got in the church now, and we had 39. Started off with about eight, and we had 39 12 years later. People from every tribe and nation. It was amazing. I remember once, I, I, I got to the point where I thought, oh, I can tell where people come from, you know. And, and I saw a young lady in our congregation one day, and I thought, I don't know where she comes from. Never seen so. Went up to her, and she, I said, where do you come from? She said, I come from Nepal. I thought, wow, that's amazing. I've got a person from Nepal. That's incredible. And anyway, an incredible story. So, God did some extraordinary things amongst us. We must simply do it His way, because His way is perfect. His way is perfect. There's no other way. Don't try and do it another way. If, if, if there are people telling you how to evangelize, and it doesn't include what God says, it's a waste of time. You have to do it God's way. His way is perfect. Perfect. Let me illustrate again. About 10 years ago, Muriel, that's my wife and my, myself, went to Palestine. Went to Bethlehem, actually, for a, for a conference on peace and justice in Palestine, believe it or not. But, uh, but to my amazement, when I got there, I didn't know what it was all about. I just was encouraged to go because it was meant to be really good and so on. We got there, I found out all the Christians there in, in the Bethlehem Bible College, and they, they were all Palestinians. And, and they said, nobody really knows we're here. And you know that Bethlehem, at one stage, uh, used to have a, a, a population which was over 50%, I think like 58%, were, were Christian Palestinians. Now it's down below 50% for the first time, because they've been running everywhere, all around the world, just to get away from the persecution. They're like a meat sandwich in between the two fighting groups, because they are Christian Palestinians. And of course, if you look carefully, you'll find Christian Jews as well. They're Jews and, and Palestinians that love Jesus. I'm sure you know Brother Andrew, God smuggler and all, all that. Do you know that back, Brother? Put up your hand if you know Brother Andrew. All the older generation, must be an older book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And uh, Brother Andrew made a profound statement in, his, in his, one of his latest books, which was called Secret Believer. Anybody read the book Secret Believer? Stunning book, actually. And uh, he said that the only way peace will truly come to Israel and Palestine is when both Jew and Palestinian put their trust in Jesus. Now that was an amazing statement when you think what's going on in Israel at the moment. Isn't that right? An extraordinary statement. The only way that true peace will come is when both groups put their trust in Jesus. And we know there's a strong work amongst Palestinians and a strong work amongst Jews now, and folk are coming to know Jesus. It's wonderful. Wonderful. But that's God's way. There's no political way that it works. It's, that's God's way, and, and that works. That works. Hallelujah. So where do we go from here? We need to obey the Lord's command. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, he said, then, then Jesus came to him and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In other words, until I come back again, I'm with you anyway, by my Holy Spirit. He is with us. And he says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all nations everywhere. That's a command to the church of God. Are we listening to it? How much has that command changed your life? How much has that command changed the life of this church? Or the Baptists, or the Evangelicals, or whatever? How much has it changed the life of the church in general? How much? 
it certainly changed my dad's life and consequently my life. My dad, just a brief little story, was uh, after... It's a, actually, I don't want to get too involved, but basically, after they got, my mum and dad got married just before the war, about 30 days before the war was declared, and my dad was called up, and he was gone for about five years, and he became a, a major, I think, in the British Army or something like that, and he was in, in a, uh, went to Monte Cassina, and he said he was sitting reading a book, a funny book, actually, in one of the trenches, and the mortar came down and hit him and blew him up and wrecked his leg. And if you know anything about the army and what people, happens to people when they get injured and so on, in those days particularly, not too much help, but basically some medics came along and they tried to amputate his leg. He said, no, don't take my leg off. I've got things to do after this war is over. Do not take my leg off. Leave it on. And funny enough, he was playing squash when he was 45, so obviously he was right and they were wrong, but there we go. And, uh, um, but I was born in 1947, just two years after the war. In 1949, my mum and dad took their three sons, they had another son when they were out in Africa, uh, to what is now Zambia and Zimbabwe, it used to be called Rhodesia in those days, the Rhodesias. When my dad started to, to, to preach the gospel on the street corner. That's how he thought. He wasn't working as a missionary for anybody, he just, just preached the gospel on the street corner. And, and eventually mission organizations heard about him and came along and tried to help him and then eventually joined the Baptist and became a Baptist minister and all that kind of thing. We won't go into that now. But, but um, while he was in Zambia, he planted six churches and many other works as well. He did an extraordinary work. He then moved to Zimbabwe and did, planted more ministries there as well and did wonderful work there. And then came down to South Africa where I'd moved and did a lot more work there as well. He did 52 years in Africa, did some amazing work for the Lord. There must be tens of thousands of people now who have been influenced by those who came to know Jesus at the time that he was an evangelist all those years ago on the street corner uh, that know Jesus because of my father. And we think, wow, that's amazing. That's mission work. That's what mission work's all about. It's, in, it's incredible. But when I was 13, I heard a South African evangelist called Richard Green preaching in our local church, our town church in Ndola. We lived in, anybody been out to, to Zambia? Ever been to Ndola? To Ndola, Kitwe, Loantia, all those places? That's where I grew up. Okay, wonderful. I'll have to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, but... Um, I heard the South African evangelist who was brought up to, from South Africa to, to Zambia to, to preach the gospel. And on the day that I heard him as a 13-year-old, he was preaching on the, on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And I was profoundly moved. I thought, oh man. And there were lots of other young people and it was you know, a con church congregation, but it was pretty full. And, he made an appeal afterwards and people went forward and thought, I, I want to go forward as well. Now, I'd come into my life to the Lord as a little child, but I wanted to go forward. I wanted to tell, him, I wanted to tell everybody I love Jesus. I wanted to go forward. But I didn't, I didn't go forward. Why not? Because I was a missionary kid. I was meant to be perfect as far as I was concerned. So, I, I, you know, they, they all thought I was a Christian anyway. But I, I longed to declare that I wanted to do what he was talking about. So afterwards I went out and outside I said, Lord, I will follow you for the rest of my life. I will serve you for the rest of my life, 13 year old. And thankfully the Lord has allowed me to do that. Praise God. Praise God. It's been short life so far, 76 years or something like that, but, but uh, I'm still young. I can say that. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact is, I know who my Redeemer is. I know who my Redeemer is. He's an amazing God. Now, by way of conclusion, I want to, to tell you just one or two more little stories. My last church in South Africa was the Durban Central Baptist Church, situated in one of the main streets of Durban, just four blocks from the beachfront. Have anybody been to Durban before in South Africa? No? You have? Yeah, good. That's, and there too, good. Okay. And uh, Durban Central Baptist Church. It was a big old... Uh, Cape Dutch kind of building, as they used to call them, and uh, 
and it was set back about uh, um, it had a little square in front of it because it was set back from the road and a little little kind of wrought iron fence so we had a little square which was our square and I always just think what can we do with that square and uh, and, one, uh, and then along came that film that was, in those days, long before TV had taken over everything kind of idea, and streaming and all that kind of stuff, a film came around uh, called uh, um, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, I think it was called, that's right, isn't it? Do you remember that film? Jesus of Nazareth? And uh, it was doing the rounds, and I wondered if I should show it in the open air. I thought, maybe I should show it in the open air. We, we, would, we would preach to people on the streets, let's see what happens. But when I watched it myself, I was a bit concerned because I thought, it's so Anglo, you know, the Lord Jesus looked like he came from Surrey, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and uh, things like that. And, uh, I, and I, it concerned me that that was the case. But, but, but I really felt God was saying, go for it, go for it. So we did. We went for it. We, we got the film. We had this, a certain group was showing it and... Uh, we put it, in, put it in the screen so it was angled so the people in the street could see what was going on. And um, uh, we put out 30 chairs. We thought, well, some people can sit inside or they can stand inside on the square and others can watch from the street. And, and it got to the point where we got to the crucifixion of the Lord. And a big pantechnicane truck had stopped opposite and all the traffic was jammed. Everybody was watching from stairs. There were people all over the place watching this film. It was extraordinary. And, and Muriel said there was a young Zulu fellow standing next to her and he put his hands in the air and he was shouting out, Jesus, what have I done? What have I done? And his eyes were streaming with tears. Amazing. You think, wow. Here's us saying, maybe we shouldn't put it on, it's too angular. But the story was so powerful. It touched people's hearts. So afterwards I thought, what am I going to do now? I, I stood up there, waited till it was all over. And I made an appeal and people came forward for salvation. I thought, this is fantastic. And what do we do next? And uh, so what we did was, for a number of months, we used to have an evening meeting outside in the street, in the square. Put out 30 odd chairs, people could come and stand, or if they wanted to sit or whatever, they could watch from the street and so on. Um, we had two, I think, is, I'm going to use a nasty word for them, two brothels, one next door to us and one over the road. And, when we, and we had people that came that were influenced from those, those places as well. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And in fact, every time I preached there, every Sunday evening for weeks and weeks, I made an appeal at the end and every single time, maybe it was only two or three, but once I think it was about 10 or 11 people came forward for salvation. And people said to me, we thought this church was closed. Because what had happened was that it had this big old Cape Dutch building at the front but they'd sold off one section of their property to a garage or something, and the main auditorium was behind there, which could seat probably 300, I don't know how many could seat, it was a big auditorium, bigger than this one here, and uh, two or 300 anyway, probably 300. And, um, uh, and he said, we thought it was closed, because we'd never seen anybody here, but now we know that there are plenty of people here. And they all started coming to the morning service, our morning service, grew incredibly because we were preaching in the streets. Wow. And I remember every time I preached, I felt anxious, oh dear, I've got to preach in the streets again. And to start off with, people would take issue with what I do. Oh, yeah, but what about, well, what about that kind of idea? And, it, uh, and eventually I, I got used to it and I, I would include it. I'd say, yeah, that's a good point. Let me just talk about that or whatever. You include it in the, in the service and and, and folk came to know Jesus and our church grew because we went out in the streets because we did what this word I've been talking to you today told us to do. We went into all the world. In our town, multitudes of people were coming in. Funny enough, although we were in, in Durban, which has a population of mostly Khoza speak, speaking people and Zulus as well, and the different people like that. No, of course it was Cape Town, wasn't it? Sorry, Zulu's uh, big one. My wife's putting me right, you've got to listen. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, Zulu's, mostly uh, Zulu's. It also had lots of immigrant people as well. 
at that stage you used to get a, a huge Franco-African group from Congo, from uh, Burundi and Rwanda and all kinds of uh, Franco-African people coming along and, and they loved coming to our church because they, they said that they had become uh, Christians because the kind of Anglo-American missionary influence in Congo had been huge and, and they wanted to be somewhere where that was happening. And so eventually we had a, a French service and an English service and things changed. Now, I have to ask you the question. As you look, you're looking now that your former pastor's moved on, you're looking for a new pastor. Why, what are you looking for in a new pastor? What are you looking for for the future? Where are you going as a church? Yes. A very good minister, very good, very good minister. Looking for a very good minister for this church. You want a fairly good minister for the church. Yeah. You want a very good minister for the church. Yeah. yeah. And but you also want to to evangelise, don't you? You don't just want to preach to Christians. You want to preach to the world. I'm not suggesting you go and preach out, outside. It's a lot more difficult. When I first came here, people in King's Cross said to me. You can't witness to people in the streets. It just doesn't work in this country. Nobody's interested in hearing about Jesus. But we did. We started student work. We had a good student work and good young adults work. And, and uh, we reached out into the streets. And, and we found that a majority of people, if you speak to them about Jesus, they wanted to hear about Jesus. There were a few who didn't. There was one guy, I think he, was, he wanted to murder me eventually. I, 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 he was, I could see he was going to hit me any minute if I said anything more about Jesus. But God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above anything we could ever ask or imagine. And our Lord Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah! What a wonderful Saviour. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful Gospel. How much we've got to tell people. People will say, oh, this life is so difficult. You say, well, why don't you trust in the Lord? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. That's what it's all about. Praise His wonderful name. Let's, all those who can stand, let's just stand up just for a moment. <laughs> Father, we just thank you and bless you and honour you for all that you've done for us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the history of this church. I don't know much about it, really, but it goes back a long way. We thank you for those who started this church. But, Lord, we know that you have much more for the Christian community in this area yet to come. Life might be getting difficult, but you've got so much more yet to do and you want to do it through these people. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you just touch this congregation in a fresh and a new way. That your will and purpose may be done in this place. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. 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 And may the Lord bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go sit down. <laughs> Let's respond to what Andrew said by singing, Build Your Kingdom Here. <laughs>
build your kingdom here, we pray. If you would like a prayer for anything that's been said or not said in the service, there will be people over that way um, at the front to pray with you. They'd love to come and pray, pray with you. Please come. There is uh, tea and coffee, and I would imagine biscuits if you get there fast enough before the young people. <laughs> Outside, please stay and have a good chat with people. We're here for the fellowship as well. And uh, let's finish with um, what Ju uh, Paul's letter to Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, to gl be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. Hello, Sam.